You've reached the High Fashion Hotline. Hi, I walked the dog, washed the car, and took the kids to practice. All that's left to do is get new summer clothes for my family. Just go to Old Navy. Old Navy? Yep, they'll love Old Navy summer styles. And right now, during Old Navy's thank you event, get 30% off your entire purchase, 40% off when you use your Old Navy card. 40% off? That's right. Don't have a card? Open one today in store and save like a super mom at Old Navy and Old Navy.com. It pays to be mom. I'm going to Old Navy now. High Fashion. Old Navy. Valid 510 to 514. 40% off for subject to credit approval. See stores for details and exclusions. Blog Talk Radio. a show today. We are going to be doing an in-depth discussion on the shack. And uh, you pretty much would have to be living under a rock to have not heard about this this book and now hit premiere movie, uh, The Shack. And uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit and uh, delve into it and Uh, Just talk about some of the reasons as to why it is important uh, that we discuss this book. Uh, And so we will we will definitely do that. Um, Let's see. Let's uh, bring in my my friend uh, Marsha Montenegro, who we're going to be interviewing here. And uh, you there, Marsha? I sure am. Hello, Devin. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Yeah, good to have you join us uh, today. We are so glad to have you, and uh, you've been on the show a few times in the past and have actually had you guest host uh, a few shows as we've looked at the New Age and a few other things, but uh, very glad that you are with us, and give me, we give a little, little background about you here. Um, you are... Let's see, the director and the founder of Christian Answers for the New Age. Uh, you were a professional astrologer before converting to Christianity. Marsh is also a graduate of Southern Evangelical Seminary, which is, uh, you know, we would say one of the best seminaries there is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, for absolutely. <laughs> In fact, uh, I was just thinking both of, our, um, both of our guests today are actually uh, SES people. So that's that's good, and um, yeah, you you kind of do a discernment type ministry where you are digging into a lot of these kind of um, controversial issues. It seems that poke their heads up a lot. Uh, is that correct? Uh, yes, my focus is uh, specifically the New Age and the occult. However, there are some areas that are peripheral to that or overlap with the new age, especially today as it mainstreams in the culture. And so uh, when something like that comes along and is 
extremely popular or is talked about a lot, or if I get a lot of questions on it, unless I determine it's really completely unrelated to my areas, um, you know, I'll try to look into it. And so that's what happened with the shack. And so I would say my, you know, my ministry is Christian Answers for the New Age, uh, but I take on some peripheral things when I can. Not that the new age isn't vast enough. <laughs> it's it's so <laughs> huge. I I could I could just you know not eat or sleep, and spend all my waking hours if it were possible, reading and researching and writing up things on the new age in the culture, and it still wouldn't be enough. I mean, I just even yeah. if I lived another fifty years. So, yeah. I have to make choices, and so I I do choose to step a little bit to the side of my ministry. Now, I do find some areas in common with the New Age and the Shack, and even more so recently as far as the author is concerned. So I'm really glad I read it. Yeah, if it's if you don't mind, maybe what I'll do is uh, I uploaded the trailer for uh, the movie The Shack, so maybe those who are not real familiar with the movie, let me go ahead and, and uh, play that trailer uh, and then maybe um, have you talk a few minutes maybe about the, the movie. Uh, Marsha, I know you went and saw that last night. Um, right. Spent a little time there, and then maybe we could we could jump into the book and uh, kind of dive into a, a little bit about uh, why these issues are important. Okay. Princess should have a red dress like mine. Where is it? Where's Missy? Missy! Where's Missy? Sorry, Mac, I haven't seen her. Missy! Missy! Oh, I'm scared. I didn't know what to do. Hostile suspect sighting. Ground teams found the truck in the mountains. I'm really sorry, Mr. Phillips. You want some help over there? I'm okay. I'll have some dinner tonight. Maybe next time. I'm so, I'm so sorry. You've lost so much already. I don't want to lose you, too. The letter showed up in my mailbox. With no tracks in the snow. You're not thinking about going back there, are you? I gotta do something. You know, this isn't a good idea. It's crazy. But this is all I got. Got a fire going inside if you want to warm up. Mackenzie Allen Phillips. I've been looking forward to this. Do I know you? Not very well, but we can work on that. You still having a hard time believing this is real? Why did you bring me here? There's no easy answer that'll take your pain away. Where were you when I needed you? I never left. Ain't it just like a tear to go and blow? You want me to forgive him? I want him to hurt like he hurt me. You want the promise of a pain for your life? Yeah. There isn't one. You can do this. I can't. But on your own, you can. This is your flying leather. Now, if people that have seen the trailer or have read the book, they know it's you know it's an emotional emotional book, and I think it um, has probably helped maybe a lot of people with with certain issues. And so, kind of right up from the from the beginning here, I just want to say there are Christians who disagree about this book, and there's probably a lot of Christians who uh, think that. 
you know, me doing a show on the shack as, as being judgmental and, you know, arrogant and unloving towards other Christians. I, we're not going to we're not going to approach this from a, a flame throwing type of <laughs> position. Um, I, I, I don't doubt uh, Mr. Young is a very nice man and I don't doubt his intentions. Uh, I'm sure his intentions are, you know, are good. We can't can't judge people's intentions or people's motives. Uh, but as Christians, we are called to be Bereans. We are called to test things by the scriptures. And, um, you know, I'm just going to say this. In America, a lot of times our theology is not really that sound sometimes. We have a lot of emotionalism and a lot of feel-good stuff and a lot of, you know, maybe traditions that have been passed down that may not be biblical. And so there's times like this when a movie or a big book comes out where, we need to test these ideas, and uh, though it's an emotional movie, and though it may make us feel better uh, during certain you know times of our lives or or whatever, um, ultimately the Bible is is the final authority, and so um, we want to be fair, we want to be even-handed, we want to be balanced at this. Uh, Approach. I think uh, Marsha and, and then we're going to have Bill on. They're going to talk uh, about some of the redeeming qualities, but there are some also some things that Christians really do need to be very careful with this book. And uh, for myself, I would not be able to to um, to in, encourage this book to be read by by my friends. It's not a book I could I could pass on. Uh, Marsha, maybe you can talk to that just a, a few minutes and just give us your kind of perspective because I know you've written books on, or uh, articles on this and um, you probably get attacked for doing that as well. So maybe you can jump in here. Right. Um, there are uh, many people who like this book and feel it has helped them. That is very clear has um, themes of pain and grief and speaks to those people because of that. Uh, And there are people who like it because they just see it as a good story. Uh, They see it as sort of a fable and it doesn't bother them that maybe things are not theologically correct. Uh, so there's that audience, and there's an audience of people who maybe aren't necessarily experiencing grief or pain, but who think the book shows God's love and think it can be a tool for evangelism. So, you know, you have a, people liking it for a variety of reasons, and I can understand all of that. I can understand, you know, what those people are saying But when you have a book where the central characters are the Trinitarian God and theological statements are made, as a Christian, especially in a book that is written by someone who says he's a Christian, we have to look at it and compare it to what the Bible teaches. Um, This is a principle in scripture that we are to examine teachings. Now, a lot of people have said, but it's not a theological treatise. Um, I see that term a lot. Well, it's not a theological treatise, but it is a book that has theology. Whenever you say something about God, some kind of statement about God, it's theology. So saying it's not theology is not true. No, it's not a theological textbook. I, I I agree with that. But that doesn't mean there isn't theology in it because the book is full of theology. <laughs> so I my my response is we have to go past the emotional effect of the book or the emotional appeal of it and be very clear sighted and look at things from a biblical viewpoint, not just with a shack, but with other things, because we don't want to be blinded by our emotions to false statements or, you know, false views of God or erroneous teachings. 
So mm-hmm. that has been basically my response. And, and also I say fiction, even if it's fiction, it is talking about God, and God is not fiction. So it's whether it's fiction or nonfiction, in my opinion, doesn't matter. When a book is writing about God or Jesus, we need to look at it based on Scripture. Yeah, very good. I I, uh, I don't know. I, I think a lot of people use that, well, it's fiction, to kind of dodge a lot of the problems with the book. And just because a yeah. work is fiction doesn't mean, doesn't mean you have a license to say whatever you want about God. I mean, and maybe this would be an appropriate place to bring up um, – and I don't even know how you feel about it, but Lewis's work, like Narnia, uh, Tim Keller had written uh, an article a while back on on the shack, and he was just, you know, kind of making some of the the comparisons. But so, what would you say to those who say, well, well, if you're against the shack, then are you against the Chronicles of Narnia and all these other type of books? Or how would you respond to that? Well, it's hard for me to respond to Narnia because I haven't read it. <laughs> So okay. I feel I feel like it's a little um uh maybe um what's the word, you know, maybe not credible for me. I, I read the first book of Narnia when I was a teenager and I wasn't a Christian. Um I didn't realize that it was about Christianity when I read it. Um I just I guess I just thought it was this kind of allegorical tale. And I didn't, I, I don't know, it was kind of interesting, and I, I liked the plot, but I didn't get any meaning out of it. Um, I think that that, as, you know, from what I know about it, it's presented very clearly as um, this, it's, well, for one thing, he never comes out and says, Aslan is Christ. Now, I know that, right. that Aslan is supposed to be Christ, but... As far as I know, there's no um, undermining of essential Christian yeah. doctrines in Narnia. So whatever right. problems it may have, um, and I know there are some. I know there's some problems with C.S. Lewis's theological views that come out in the books. Um, I'm aware of those, having read about them. But uh, there's no essential doctrine like the nature of God or the nature of the Trinity, um, the atonement, uh, judgment on sin, and, and things like that, the attributes of God, that are compromised in Narnia that I'm right. aware of. That's, so yeah, that's a, uh, if, that's you're, if somebody's going to com- – I'm sorry, what? Oh yeah, yeah. I was saying that's that is a that's a great great response. Um, re- real quick, let me read this little section from Keller on his article about this. Uh, he says there's another modern text that sought to convey the character of God through story. It also tried to embody the biblical doctrine of God in an imaginative way that conveyed the heart of the biblical message. That story contained a Christ figure named Aslan. Uh, unlike the author of the Shack, however, C.S. Lewis. Uh, was always at pains to maintain the biblical tension between the divine love and its overwhelming holiness and splendor. Uh, In the introduction to the book Problem of Pain, Lewis cites the example from the children's text, uh, Wind in the Willows, where there are two characters, Rat and Mole. They approach divinity. uh, Afraid, murmured the rat, his eyes shining with an unutterable love. Afraid of him, oh, never, never, and yet, and yet, oh, mole, I am afraid. He says, Lewis sought to get this uh, across at many places through Narnia tales. One of the most memorable is in the description of Aslan, where it goes, quote, safe. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And I think you're you're right as to where he's still using, you know, imaginative um, works, but it's not undermining or diminishing other attributes of God. Is that that's kind of what you're saying? Yes, yes, and I think that that is as that is what we have to think about when any book or movie presents God, whether it's um, you know nonfiction or a fictional imaginative story. Um, you can present God in a fictional story. So I don't see anything wrong with that. The thing is, if you're going to do it, then the attributes of God need to be 
aligned with what Scripture teaches about who God is. And yeah. when it departs from, from those attributes or clearly and clearly departs, uh, then one has the right to point that out. Yeah. Yep. Well, maybe you can kind of give us a little background. What is the book uh, or the movie about? Uh, you, I'll let you kind of decide where you want to go with that. But uh, maybe okay. for those who've not read the read the book, what's kind of what's the plot? Right. The the story is uh, this man named Mac, who's married and has three children, goes on a camping trip with his children. Uh, his wife is is not along, and they're at a campground and his older son and daughter are on a little uh, boat or canoe and it tips over and the son is trapped underneath. So uh, Mac has to dive into the water to try to save his son from drowning. Meanwhile, the youngest daughter who's only six named Missy is sitting back, um, you know, near their, their camper at a table. So, in all of the chaos and the um, fear that's going on about the son drowning, you know, Mac does save his son and they get him breathing again. When he goes back to where he left Missy, she's missing. And it turns out that um, they track, they're able to track, uh, uh, I guess, her, her smell through these bloodhounds to this old shack in the woods. And her dress is there, and then there's blood stains on the floor. And the police tell Mac that there's been a a man who's been abducting and killing children. So it looks, you know, it's clear that it's, everyone's pretty clear that she's been murdered, but her body's not there. Um, so this, of course, is is the tragedy that starts the the story off. And Mac has become very you know, withdrawn into himself in grief and and things are just not good because of, of this horrible tragedy. And he gets one day a note. He sees a note in the mailbox to him, but there's no stamp on it. And it's a note saying, meet me at the shack. And it's signed Papa. Well, Papa is Mac's wife's name for God. He never calls God Papa, but she does. And see, at first he thinks this is probably um, from the murderer trying to lure him back, and he goes there with a gun. But what happens is that he he discovers, well, I won't go into all the detail, but it turns out that he, at the shack, it turns into this beautiful cottage and with flowers, and, and it's just really gorgeous, like this retreat. And there's an African woman there. Um, who turns out to be Papa, God, the father. And then there's a Jewish-looking man who's, of course, Jesus. And then there's a Asian woman who is the Holy Spirit. And so Mac is meeting up with the Trinity. And once he realizes that, he starts asking questions, and he also expresses anger to God about what happened to his daughter and how could God allow that. So there are these, these dialogues going on in the book where Mac is being told different things and they're the father, the son and the Holy spirit characters are supposedly teaching Mac things and helping him through his grief. He also meets a, a fourth person in the book. Um, she's named Sophia which means wisdom in Greek. And there's a lot about wisdom in Proverbs, especially. Um, but in the movie, interestingly, for some reason, they don't use um, the name Sophia. She just says, um, my name is Wisdom. And so he has a session with wisdom, <laughs> and and different things are said there about judgment. And that's the, the basic plot of the book. And then it ends up that it it looks like the whole thing could have been either an out of body type experience for him because he was in an accident or a dream. Um, it's not, it's not real clear cut whether what, what he saw in the cottage and what happened there really happened or not, but he did learn the lessons from it. So that is the basic, that's the basic overall story. 
And the problems come in with um, the things that these Trinity characters say at different times. Of course, some of the things they say are, are true and are okay. So usually when you have a problematic book, you have a mixture of truth and, and falsehood. You don't, not usually, it's very, I don't know of any book where everything is false. I can't, I can't really think of <laughs> any any book. It's totally everything in it is false. Um, so you're going to have things that are true. And I think a lot of people notice the true things and then either don't notice the things that are dicey or they ignore them. So, uh, and I do want to say the movie is, I put in my article on it, which is on Facebook and, and eventually will make it to my website, um, that the movie really softens the book because the movie has the visuals. And this cottage is beautiful in the movie. The colors are it's photographed, um, you know, or not photographed, but filmed very well. And the characters are very appealing. I mean, Octavia Spencer, who was recently up for an Academy, um, is, is Papa. And then I don't know the actors, but the um, man who plays Jesus is very good. And uh, the woman who plays the Holy Spirit is is very, very beautiful. So there are these beautiful visuals in it and some very, very emotional scenes, of course. And my feeling in the movie is that this is going to make people who haven't read the book want to read the book. It's going to make people who liked the book like the book even more because it's very, very hard not to like the movie as in terms of its impact. Um, right. Even though it's gotten critical reviews in the secular press, I can completely understand how appealing it is and how someone would like it. So, um, however, it's so it's much harder to criticize the movie. And also the movie leaves out some of the more problematic, what I call heretical statements um, that are in the book. Uh, the movie has some, but it leaves out a few real bad ones. So <laughs> it's going to be harder to criticize the movie than to criticize the book. Um, sure. And it makes you look kind of like a mean person because here's the story of this man who's gone through this tragedy and losing his daughter in probably the worst possible way. And, um, you know, it's kind of like, well, how can you, you know, how can you criticize anything about a story about this father going through this horrible, tragic loss? and who's grief-stricken, and God's comforting him and giving words of wisdom, et cetera. So it's kind of like, you know, it's sort of like, well, how could anybody be against it? So when you try to criticize it, especially with people who like it, uh, they tend to not want to hear it, or they think that you have some kind of um, theological, you know, some kind of theological, I can't think of the there's an idiom for it, something that you want to, you want to do, you know, it's like you have something that you want to criticize and you found it in the shack. And so, you know, now you're going to criticize it or you just like to criticize things. But the book, um, do you want me to, to just tell you a few of the things that I found um, to be problematic? Yeah, I've got your I've got your article up here and I see you kind of have it um, divided with scripture and the strange spirit and that. So, yeah, what are what are some of the few uh, issues that you have seen with it. Uh, real quick, uh, those who would like to call in and uh, talk with uh, Marsha, we've got her for about the next 30, 35 minutes or so. Uh, feel free to call in at 760-542-3907. That's 760-542-3907. We will put you right on and uh, let you ask your question or make your comment. And, uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Marsha. I'll let you go ahead and and uh, just kind of go where you would like to lead with some of the issues that you, that you see. Okay. Um, of course, I think the most obvious one is the appearance of God the Father as a woman. I think this um, is what has upset a lot of people. And I, I agree that I do not think this is a – biblically correct way to portray God the Father. Now, having said that, I don't think it's the worst thing. I actually think there are worse things. However, 
you know, the Bible is very clear that God wants to be seen as in masculine terms and as the father. He's never called mother, um, although there are passages where God has what we would call uh, female attributes, um, you know, like um, comforting his children or caring for his children and other kinds of nurturing qualities, which, of course, God has. God still is very clear about being referred to as father. Jesus called him father. And this is the way God presents himself and how he wants us to relate to him. So to to switch that and especially to change it, uh, according to people who defend this view, to ch- they say, well, it's done to make God more approachable or to maybe be more comforting to people. For example, in the shack, and we see this in the movie, it's because Mac's father was abusive. And so Papa appears as a woman because appearing as a man would be more difficult for Mac. But as soon as you say that that's okay, even in a in an imaginary way, uh, what you're saying is that we need to have God on our terms or God needs to be something that we need. In other words, God has to, in order to reach us, we have to have a different view of God or God has to be presented in a book in a different way than the way he is in the Bible. And so... It compromises the nature of God, and I find that very troubling um, because it's also saying that God as Father cannot be comforting and cannot be as loving unless he appears as a woman. Um, And and this is actually really a kind of an anti-feminist thing to say in my opinion because it's like – it's like, uh, what, are you saying now that uh, only men can do this and only women can do that? You know, it's, it's God is right. very loving in the Bible. Even the Old Testament, which is, of course, often stereotyped as a book of an angry God who's always, you know, throwing lightning bolts at people. Um, actually, it's the same God as in the New Testament. And we see over and over again in the Old Testament how he rescued Israel, even though they constantly disobeyed him, they started worshiping false gods, um, even if they were um, temporarily punished by God, perhaps by being taken in captivity, um, God would rescue them, God would take them out of captivity, God cared for them, God loved them, simply right. because he loved them. He even even says in a passage, it's not because of anything you've done that I'm doing this for you. So God's love is from beginning to end of the Bible. And I think we can show that through God as God the Father. He doesn't have to be God the Mother to show love and care. So that's one of the big problems of, of, of the book. Also, the fact that God's appearing as a human because, um, and whether it's a woman or a man, Jesus is the one who came to show us what God is like. And even though God doesn't have a physical body, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so Jesus is the most perfect image of the Father. And there's no other image or person who can compare to that. Jesus is matchless. So to try to, it's kind of like putting Jesus aside and putting this other character, in this case a woman, as that image. So those are my two main issues with presenting um, Papa as a woman. Um, sure. The fact that she's African American doesn't bother me and I don't think matters, but it's the other issues. Um, so that's one of the big problems. Then there's other, other problems in here too, where, and this is in the movie too, where Papa shows Mac scars on, her, I don't know whether to say her or his <laughs> wrist, uh, wrist to show that he was on the cross with Jesus. And in the book, Papa says to Mac, we three, you know, we all incarnated, the whole trinity. 
Well, of course, it's not what the Bible teaches. God the Son incarnated, and only God the Son. Not God the Father, not the Holy Spirit. So this is a very big, um, really a heretical teaching. So it's that's a problem right there. So there's another another issue that bothered me. Um, there's a lot of other things too, where um, God seems to be says something about He's here to serve, you know, to serve man. Um, the majesty of God, the majesty and the righteousness of God, are very much compromised in the book. Um, partly through his, it seems to be going out of his way to to make man feel better or feel okay, kind of on man's terms instead of God's terms. And then there's the issue of judgment, and that does come up in the movie as well. So God's judgment on sin is is pretty much. Uh, is well, pretty much it is undermined in the book and the movie. And God even says, sin is its own punishment. I don't need to punish sin. Sin is its own punishment. And you see this clearly in the movie when Mac is talking to Wisdom, and Wisdom tries to force him to choose. She, she has the daughter and son standing in front of him. Of course, they're not really standing there, but they're standing there for this this particular lesson and she says choose one of your children to go to heaven and one to go to hell and she keeps she keeps trying to get him to do this and he and he refuses he he won't do it and you know the whole lesson of that scene that i got in with wisdom was that you know how and she said oh and she says now you know papa's heart so, well, what does that mean? Well, it's not really said clearly, but you could take away from that that it's implying God, you know, doesn't want to judge or God can't judge or God won't judge. You know, it's very unclear, but there's this idea that judging is somehow not what God does. But if God is righteous, he must judge sin because his righteous nature cannot abide sin. Sin is something that is against God. And if God is righteous, and if he's a a God of love and justice, then he has wrath on sin. And his wrath on sin is completely in balance with his love. It's not opposed to it. And I think a lot of people see it as contrary to love. So if God is loving, then there's not going to be wrath on, on, on sin. But, of course, if that were true, then God would accept sin, and God would accept, he would have to accept all sin, because then what sins is he going to accept and what sins is he not going to accept? So right. all sins would have to be accepted. And if right. that's true, then there's no justice. So because then you can do evil things and, well, you know, God's so loving, it's okay. Well, then what kind of justice is there? There has to be this judgment on sin. And um, there's one point where where uh, they're talking about the murderer, the man who murdered Missy. And Papa says, he is my son too. And I want to redeem him. Well, that means that he's not redeemed, so therefore he can't be God's son because we're adopted as son and daughters through faith in Christ. Oh, the other thing about the wrath on sin is if there's no wrath on sin and no judgment on sin, then why did Jesus come? Yeah. Yep. Because <laughs> That's kind of an important what point, was the point it? of Jesus coming yeah. and taking on the wrath on sin and paying the penalty for sin? There was no point in him and dying on the cross anyway, um, if that's true. So it kind of does away completely with the need for the atonement for Jesus on the cross. So if you, if, you know, people would think about what are the implications and what are the consequences of these ideas that seem to be presented and or implied in the book and in the movie, what is the consequence of this? Well, one of them is Jesus just, wasted his time on the cross 
Uh, and there's the, you know, there's a hint of universalism. It's not, it's not really regular <clears throat> universalism, um, like in the Unitarian Church, which does not teach that Jesus had to die on the cross, but it's another kind where if Jesus died on the cross, so everybody is really saved, but they just need to choose to be in a relationship with God. This is in the book, and apparently before the book was published, when it was first written, it was more clear that that was William Young's view, but they removed that and took it out. So it's hard to show it from the book, but you can see hints of it. Um, my main well, concerns are the character and attributes of God that are being undermined or changed in the book. Yeah, I, I have a clip um, I can I can play where uh, William Young was interviewed on TBN fairly recently, and uh, it's on. They're talking a little bit about. Universalism. It's uh, they're talking about his new book, which will probably be mm. another show. <laughs> probably be another yeah. show <laughs> in and of itself. Uh, but let me play this clip. Uh, he talks uh, a little bit about universalism, but would love to get your your thoughts on this. He's uh, this is William Young, author of The Shack, being interviewed uh, on TBN. Matt Companion, and a good question. This is a line from Eve. A good question is worth a thousand answers. Wow. And so the questions that have come up, uh, and, and you'll hear some of them, like I get, uh, I, I get called uh, different things. Uh, my mom, even when she first time tried to read the shack, called me a heretic. But, <laughs> but she's past that now. And that's a marvelous story I'll Your tell you. Your mama calls you a heretic. Yeah. That's bad. Yeah, she called my sister and did it. She didn't yeah. call me and did it. Oh, got it. <laughs> So, oh, your brother. Yeah, yeah, and it was when Papa came through the door. Oh, okay. So there's questions about, is God more he than she? Do we, you know, and that's one of the lies, that God is more he than she. Or God is in control. Yeah. Or, I mean, things that we just make assumptions about that affect the way that we look at God. I get, I get called a universalist all the time. And in some senses, I, I'm, that's probably true. I believe the entire cosmos, the whole universe was created in Christ. If that's the universalist, I guess I am. Yeah. I believe that we were that we were all included when Jesus, to, to quote scripture, when Christ died, we all died. Yeah. And when he rose, we all rose. Mm. Right? That nothing that has come into being has come into being apart from him. But there are parts of the accusation of universalism that I am absolutely not. And, and we get to talk about that inside a book like this. Got it. Right? So, I'm, I, I don't think all roads lead to God. If it wasn't, if, because I believe Jesus is the creator and everything is connected to him and by being the creator there is nothing in the entire cosmos that is not in relationship to Jesus so there's no controversy in other words with the scripture that says I am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father but by me so that you adopt that right and, the, and so you clear that type of stuff up correct and, and the, the only reason that there is any controversy about that verse at all is because we have a too low of a Christology our view of Jesus is too small. We just think that he is a response to Adam rather than the creator who is the Father, Son, and anointed in the Holy Spirit. Mm. That means everything in the universe has a, has a connection to Jesus. Yeah, so, you know, mm. several statements there I, I just find very problematic and uh, somewhat mm. ambiguous. But, um, you know, that uh, God is in control, that's one of the lies that... Uh, we believe. What, what are your thoughts on on that uh, specific clip? Yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 I think that he is rejecting some basic things, basic <clears throat> truths about God given in Scripture uh, for for his very, for his own reasons, and he's rejecting these and wants to see that God is more amenable, maybe, to man's needs or or man's, I don't know, he's more, God is more willing to accommodate man. I, I get that impression from the, from the shack and from what he, what he says there. I, I did listen to that last week, and right now when you replayed it, I couldn't hear it real well, well, real well, so I don't remember everything he said. But it's, the other, the other thing is that he's just very ambiguous. It's hard, well, what is yeah. he saying, you know, is, 
he won't really come down and be real clear cut about whether Jesus is the only way. I, I, I got the impression in the book that he doesn't think that, but it's very hard to pin him down on it. And I find this to be very true of people like Rob Bell and Brian McLaren. Well, it's more clear now with Rob, Rob Bell where he stands because he's yeah. so far away from Christianity. And, but, when, but these people like that, they tend to be kind of ambiguous. So one moment you're listening to them and they're and you're thinking, well, okay, he's not that far off from scripture. And then the next huh. sentence, they'll say something <laughs> that's, that's yeah. like, that makes you go, Oh, well, wait a minute. Maybe he is. <laughs> and um, it's, it's, it makes it hard to, to know, well, what does he really believe? Now this book that just came out yesterday, his latest book, lie, I think it's lie, lies about God that we believe or something like that. Um, maybe he'll be more clear cut in that book. I would like to read it. I, I don't. I don't have time right now, but at some point down the road, I would like to read it, assuming clear cut in it. Um, so I, I think that's one of the problems. It's very hard to pin him down on certain things. Yeah. So we have to look at what we do have. <clears throat> now the other thing that's in the book that was not in the movie, that's a very serious problem, is quoting Paul Tillich and saying that God is the ground of all being. And yeah. he makes a lot of statements in the book that are, are what I would consider to be panentheistic. So that's God is contained in creation, yet God also transcends creation. So God is distinct from creation, but he's also contained in it. And I did see that hinted at in, in several places in the book. And then especially at the end where, and this is said by by um, Papa to Max, uh, or is it said by Jesus? I have to look at my article. It's one of the Trin- one of the Trinity characters says this to Max that God is the um, a ground of all being. And I, I when I read that, I really almost jumped. Um, <laughs> yeah. I almost jumped um, out of my chair because I thought, what? This is like a really really serious thing. Oh, it's Jesus. He says. He's telling Mac appearances don't matter because being always transcends appearance. And he, then he says, God, who is the ground of all being, dwells in, around, and through all things, ultimately emerging as the real. And any appearances that mask that reality will fall away. Well, when I read this, immediately this took me back to my New Age beliefs, because this is very uh, Hindu and New Age, this view. So you have to ask yourself, well, wait a minute. God is the ground of all being, and appearances that mask that reality will fall away. So are appearances false? Are they not reality? Is there only, is God the only reality? I mean, it almost sounds like that. It it reinforces um, this idea that our world is not the real world. And... um, so you have, a, I write about that in my article. Um, people interested can read my article on the book at Christian Answers for the New Age um, dot org under book evaluations. And I have a few, a whole few paragraphs on just that one statement because this is a a not only an unbiblical view, it's an anti-biblical view uh, because okay. God created the world and the world is real. It's not just an appearance that is masking reality. And God is not underlying the world. Creation reflects that there is a creator. And creation reflects um, the power of God and his immensity, his vastness, the infinity of God. Because, you know, our our universe is so vast, we can't even count all the, we don't even know how many galaxies there there are, much less how many stars there are. It just goes on and on and on and on. And right. so far that we can't see them. I mean, this shows how incredibly vast God is because he created all this. Uh, so it, it reflects God, but God is not at all a part of creation in any way, shape, or form. But this statement here definitely says that he is. And, and there's other statements Young has made that imply he has that view. And that, to me, may be the most serious problem in the book or maybe one of my top three serious problems in the book. So um, 
I, I do want to mention this because I think it's related to what I just discussed. Can I say something about the conference that you Oh, is? yeah, yes. Yeah, let me uh, let me give the number out real quick and then uh, okay. carry on. Yep, I want to get okay. uh, let people, if they want to talk with you, be able to call before you got to go. The number is 760-542-3907. Uh, 760-542-3907. We'd love to hear from you. Feel free to call in, and we will put you on with uh, Marsha. But go ahead. You were talking about a particular conference? Yes. Um, there is a conference uh, that William Young is going to be a part of in early April. This conference is sponsored by a man named Richard Rohr, who's a Franciscan a uh, priest who has the Center for Action and Contemplation in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is a, something he started a number of years ago. And the other person that's going to be part of this conference is um, Cynthia Bergeau. Uh And the conference is, interestingly, on the Trinity. And this is kind. Of, this is really sad because Richard Rohr and Cynthia Bergeau both have heretical views of the Trinity, and and Young is joining them. They're the only three. They're the three speakers, and it's sponsored by Richard Rohr. Now I have posted many times on Richard Rohr on Facebook. He's very problematic. Um, one of the main problems is he makes a distinction between Jesus and the Christ. So the Christ is more than Jesus. And this, the is Christ gets things, this is Richard Rohr. This is Richard um, Rohr, R-O-H-R. So the is Christ he, is, is he, more. Is, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Marsha. I was just going to ask. He's, uh, you say he's a Franciscan? He's a Franciscan priest. And okay. Cynthia Bourgeau wow. is Franciscan, too. I, I think she's a nun, technically. Um, but And they're both on the same page theologically, um, Richard Rohr, let me say this quickly so people understand Richard Rohr. He has had New Agers and Buddhists and other non-Christians speak at his conferences. He calls himself a perennialist. There's really a lot to say about him. He calls himself a uh. perennialist, which means he, sees, he's, he believes there's truth in all religions, but not just that. They're all leading towards this one truth everything's evolving because he and Cynthia Bourgeau are followers of Teilhard de Chardin now I am not an expert on Teilhard de Chardin but I I do know his view was that everything is evolving towards this point called the omega point which is this truth and everything is going that way so it's it's like there isn't really anything false because everything is evolving towards the truth point. And G and Christ, the cosmic Christ, um, who is really beyond a personal being and is beyond Jesus, is drawing everything towards the Omega point. So they're both followers of Teilhard de Chardin. They're both admitted panentheists. They both admit it. There are followers of another woman named Elia Delio, who has written quite a bit about her panentheism, and she is Roman Catholic. Um, this, and so there, and also, oh, even beyond that, Cynthia Bourgeau is also a follower of Gurdjieff. Now, Gurdjieff falls right into my New Age era <laughs> um, very nicely because Gurdjieff was a part of the Theosophical Society, which is a, a, like an early New Age occult. Eastern group, and then he he left the Theosophical Society and went out on his own, formed his own group, got his own followers, still has followers today, and Gurdjieff called himself a mystic Christian, or a Christian mystic, and of course he was not Christian, but he takes Christianity and blends it with these esoteric Gnostic type belief systems. And so that's where Gurdjieff's coming from. Well, Cynthia Bourgeau wrote a book on the Trinity. And underneath it, if you look at the cover of it, it says the law of three. She writes that the Trinity is based on the law of three as taught by Gurdjieff. And, I mean, then it just goes downhill from there. And Richard Rohr has written a book on 
the Trinity. I have not read it, but I read an article about it by Fred Sanders. And I have a post on um, everything I'm talking about right now is a post on Facebook. If you do a search with my name followed by Shaky Shack, Shaky Trinity, it will probably come up. And I okay. have all this information in that post. It's not on my website. And Fred, and I have a link at the end. I have links to many d- different things on Richard Rohr um, and other things. And I have a link to the article written by Fred Sanders on the book on the Trinity by Rohr, which, of course, is heretical because he has a heretical view of Jesus to begin with. So, of course, his view of the Trinity is heretical. And he's a follower of Tahir de Chardin, who is a heretic, and... You know, it just, the more you look at these people, the worse it gets. Well, William Young, by the way, wrote the foreword to Richard Rohr's book on the Trinity. Oh, wow. Yeah. (laughs) He wrote the foreword to the book. And now, which I guess means he agrees with it, you know, I would like to read the foreword. I haven't, but he is now joining them for this conference on the Trinity. I I don't know if, um, you know, audio will be available of it. I would like to get it because I would like to hear especially what William Young says. This to me is evidence um, that all the concerns people have had and saw in the shock, shack, in the shock, well it was shock, it was a shocking (laughs) shack, they saw saw in in the shack are basically vindicated by this. Um, you know, I don't feel that I was over harsh in my criticisms of the theological issues I saw. Now that I know about Young, you know, palling around with Richard Rohr and Cynthia Bourgeau, I mean, it's I, it's fine to be friends with them. I don't see anything wrong with that at all. Richard Rohr is a very likable person. You can g- go on YouTube and put Richard Rohr in. There's dozens of YouTube videos of Richard Rohr and interviews with him and <clears throat> And, and and videos of him speaking. He's very personable, very, very likable, great sense of humor. But to go in with them theologically is like the biggest red flag I can think of for young. Yeah, and, I'm surprised being that they're Catholic, that they, you know, are not come under some type of excommunication or something, because normally Catholics are, are fairly solid on the doctrine of the Trinity. So that surprises me. Yeah, I I think maybe I don't I don't really know why why that hasn't happened. But my guess from different things I've read is that the Catholic Church is very slow moving on things like that. They are okay. very 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 slow moving. It takes a lot of time and effort to get them to even investigate, <clears throat> much less do anything. So I think until war maybe. I don't know. Maybe it's maybe they are investigating him, and we don't know about it. That's possible. Um, but for whatever reason, that's not my concern. My concern is yeah. yeah that that young is being read by people when he's somebody who's okay with Richard Rohr's theology. Right. Well, give us uh, give us a couple concluding thoughts here. We've got around two minutes or so. Give us some con- concluding thoughts you have on the shack and maybe, um, I don't know, just some advice for believers who are wanting to maybe engage other Christians uh, who are maybe caught up in this book. Yes. Um, yeah, I'd be glad to. Well, first of all, the other person has to be willing to, the person who likes the book or the movie has to be willing to want to talk about it and <laughs> hear you out. Um so I, I think it's I think it's real important not to throw out real extreme words right off the bat, like the shack is from the devil or the shack is <laughs> it's just a heretical book. Or, you know, if you just start off like that, I mean, obviously, you're not going to really be able to dialogue with a person. So I don't think that's a good right. approach. I think it's good to say, you know, I I want to compare a book like this with scripture because it is talking about God and you know I saw some things in it that don't line up with scripture and did did you notice these things can I tell you about them you know just a very you know low-key gentle approach 
would you like to hear about them? Some people may have missed them and may actually be glad to know about them. People do change their minds on books. I've seen it before with people who liked a bad book. If they really, you know, listened or read something someone wrote pointing out the problems, uh, you know, they've come back and said, you know, I'm glad that I read that. I missed that. Or now that I think about it, I see that that's not good. So, you know, just, just say, can I show you? where there are problems. So you have to know, be aware of the problems. Now, if you haven't read the book or seen the movie, you can read my article or an article by uh, Dr. Geisler and your next, your next guest, Bill Roach, <laughs> is a very good article. And there are several other articles. It's easy to find them online. And I think it's okay if you haven't. Now, a lot of people will say, well, if you haven't read the book, you can't tell me what's wrong with it. Well, you can say, well, what about this person who read it and wrote this? You know, this Christian read the book and was bothered by several things. Here are some of the things they were bothered by. So at least be familiar with an article that that lays out the problems. And just you don't have to know all of them, but pick, you know, two and bring them up with the person. So we, we, we want to dialogue, especially, you know, with other Christians. We don't want to be divisive and, um, you know, make them feel that, you know, we don't want to make them feel like they're bad people or something because they like the book. We want to help them see the problems <clears throat> in the book. So I, I don't know. That's my best my best answer on, on doing that. I'm not the best at it myself. I have to remind myself <laughs> <laughs> to be patient <laughs> because I tend to uh, get very intense. So I, this is, I'm talking to myself as much as to anybody else. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, you're, you're so knowledgeable and, uh, just really appreciate you, you being willing to come on. Give us your, give us your website again for people, uh, can check it out. And what's the, the name of your article again for people that are wanting to look at that? Okay. It's, uh, Christian Answers for the New Age dot org. And which is the name of my ministry. Um, and go under, go to the articles page and then go to book evaluation. And it's called What's at the Back of the Shack, but it's, it's um, alphabetized under S so that if people are looking for the shack, they would, they would see it, hopefully. And um, if they want to read things on Facebook, I've written about this, then I have a personal page. And I also have a Facebook page called Christian Answers for the New Age that should be very easy to find. And I have several posts there right now that deal with the shack. So those are some different ways people can read the material I have on this topic. Okay, great. And I actually just um, I posted your article in the okay. comment section below on our Theology Matters page. So, uh, folks, if you're out there looking for the article, just go to the, uh, facebook.com slash theology matters with the Palouse. That's facebook.com slash Theology Matters with the Palouse, and uh, that'll get you to that article. So, Marcia, I want to thank you for coming on, and, you know, we've had you on several times before, and I imagine, God willing, we'll have you on several times again. I hope so. Thank you so much, Devin, for having me as a guest. I really appreciate it, and it's always a pleasure to be on with you. Absolutely, absolutely. We will look forward to uh, having you on again. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. God bless. All right, folks. Uh, what we're going to do is take a break for a couple minutes and uh, transition. We're going to bring Dr. Uh, Roach on the show. He's on the line. He's waiting. So hang in there, there uh, Bill, and uh, we'll get with you. And we'll go ahead and take a, uh, a break for a couple minutes. We'll come back. We'll, we, we will continue our discussion on... The Shack, an in-depth discussion. This is John MacArthur. Join me for today's Portraits of Grace. When God devises a plan, he always makes the necessary provisions for carrying it out, even when that plan may seem impossible from our finite perspective. I'm sure the Israelites must have had some lingering concerns about God's plan to take them out of Egypt. Could the sprinkling of blood on their doorpost truly keep the angel of death from killing their firstborn? And what about following Moses across the bottom of the Dead Sea with massive walls of water on both sides? 
Well, in spite of those circumstances, they obeyed and God proved faithful. I hope you realize that God's provisions are always best. They may sometimes seem hard to believe to the human intellect, but you prove your faith when you trust God, believe His promises, receive His provisions gratefully. This is John MacArthur encouraging you to live as portraits of grace. I need to hear constantly that the pastor of the church, our Lord Jesus Christ, is gentle, forbearing, patient, and kind. There's a wonderful text in the 18th Psalm where David says Lord your gentleness has made me great what do you expect from a pastor I want them to preach faithfully that's absolutely vital what about his character is he kind in his humanity our Lord Jesus Christ was moment by moment upheld by his father and if that is the model then reformed pastors will be men who recognize that they are upheld men. In other words, they are spirit-dependent servants. And reformed pastors are to be men who serve the people of God, and the people are to know that their pastors are men who will do all within their powers, to seek their good, who will go out of their way morning, noon or night to serve their spiritual, present and eternal good. Not men who cultivate a name for themselves, but men who have one boast, Jesus Christ is Lord. One of the principal notes of the Reformed pastor will be to help his people more and more understand this that there are people that God loves that is the pattern that is to shape the life and ministry of the reformed pastor here's a renewing your mind minute with Dr. R.C. Sproul. Somebody said to me, I told somebody that I believed that I was chosen, and the response was, well, you're very egotistical for saying that. Now, if we think that we're chosen because we were so eminently choosable, and that God chose us for something he saw in us or foresaw in us, yes, that would be supremely egotistical. But if he chose us according to his purposes and his good pleasure and strictly by his grace, like the apostle himself says, where is boasting? It's excluded. If my salvation rests completely on the grace of God, I have nothing of which to boast in myself. It's the end of egotism. For today's special offer, visit RenewingYourMind.org. All right, folks, welcome back to Theology Matters with Blues, and we are doing a special Wednesday edition of Theology Matters, and we are taking an in-depth look at the shack, an in-depth look at this very popular book, now feature film. So first hour, we had Marsha Montenegro join us from Christian Answers for a New Age. If you guys go to uh, facebook.com slash theology matters with the Palouse, you will find uh, the, her, the article she has written on the shack. Uh, and if you go to the archives there, you'll see uh, where we've had Marsha on several times in the past. Uh, she's an expert on the occult and astrology and one of the few really one of the few Christian apologists that deal with uh, kind of the new age and the occult. So she is a tremendous resource and we are blessed to have her Uh, real quick before we get into this next segment with my friend, uh, Dr. Roach. um, Several people have been asking, uh, we made an announcement that uh, we are going to be launching a house church uh, from my house. Actually Uh, we will start uh, that on Saturday, April 8th. I had the date wrong there. I put April 1st. 
and uh, I will actually be out of town speaking in Boone at an apologetics conference that weekend, so keep us in prayer with that. But uh, it'll be April 8th, and we're going to do Saturday nights for the first three or four Saturday nights. Uh, We're going to just do that in the month of April, and we're going to start around 6 o'clock, and... Uh, you know, it's going to be a, a legit church with uh, communion, with uh, church discipline, the whole the whole nine yards, the preaching of the word, all the marks of a true church. Uh, if you are interested in this, uh, shoot me an email at holytrinityrh at gmail.com. That's holytrinityrh at gmail.com. You can go to our website at holytrinityrockhill.org. That's HolyTrinityRockHill.org. We are a, a Reformed Baptist uh, church holding to the 1689 London Baptist Confession. And, uh, you know, we're going to have a – it's going to be – I think it's going to be a good thing. I think it will be good for the community. You know, we'll have a focus on apologetics as well as good sound uh, theology. So email us if you have questions about that or if you are interested. So – with that said, let me go ahead and get to my friend uh, Bill Roach. Um, he, Dr. Roach holds a Ph.D. from Southern Baptist uh, Theological Seminary, uh, Theology and Philosophy of Religion, and a graduate degree from Southern Evangelical Seminary, and uh, is just an all-around good guy. Bill, are you there, buddy? I am here, Devin. It's good to be on your show with you this evening. Always good to have you on the show. We've had Bill on what a couple times now. You've done talked about the the book you guys did with Dr. Geisler on inerrancy, and I think we've had you on a couple other times. I can't remember what we talked about though. I think we did another one on the new perspective on Paul. So we're kind of coming oh, full right. circle here. That's right. That's right. So, folks, one of the reasons I, I – is it okay if I call you Bill, or are you going to make me call you Dr. That's Roach? Fine. Like That's you, fine. Yeah. He normally makes me call him Dr. Roach when we're we're just talking normally. <laughs> yes. You're, Devin also wants me to refer to him as the Pope on, you know, non-formal occasions, but that's a different story. So. That's right. That's right. No, Bill, uh, Bill and Dr. Norm Geisler wrote a uh, really good uh, article – Several years back, I'll let him talk a little more about that, but it's, man, it is kind of like one of the go-to um, articles on the shack. And so I wanted to, to bring him on and maybe he can kind of walk us through this article. But tell us uh, a little bit about that article, uh, Bill. You'd said that since it came out in like 2006 or whatever, it's had how many views? Well, we put this article out, I believe it was around 2000 and seven or eight right in there, the exact year that the book was published. And the background of it is is that Dr. Geisler and I were both out speaking around the country, and people in the pews and leadership were just inundating us with questions about this book. So at that point we thought, okay, now's the time to read the book because a lot of people were encouraging us to. And, you know, a lot of people will give this idea of saying, oh, the book really helped me, and you should read it. And so I did. And they asked, well, what did you think? And I don't think they were as favorable of my response. And it wasn't that I was mean in my response. It's just I had to encourage them to say, you know, this book is revealing more an issue of a lack of evangelical discernment when they're reading the book. And it's because of the doctrines presented. So we got together and we wrote this little article, didn't really think much of it. It was just something that was supposed to be quick, something that we would hand out to the people. And we have literally had hundreds of thousands of people read that article. Just last weekend alone, um, we had close to over 30,000 hits on just Saturday for this article on the website defendinginerrancy.com, but on all the websites over about the last eight years. I mean, it's hard to tell how many we've had, literally hundreds of thousands, according to some of our web browser counts from different people. So the Lord has definitely shown favor to it, nothing that we've done. We've never promoted it, really. Um, I just think people are asking questions about Shaq, and that's why it's an important conversation point. Very good, very good. Um, We've had Marsha on for the last hour. We had opened up the phone lines, and 
Uh, we've got somebody that has called in. Bill, are you good with taking a call? I'm sure. <laughs> you you really haven't got to say uh, anything, but uh, probably be on the on the heels of what Mark just said. Yeah. Uh, caller, are you there? Very good. Very good. Um, Hello, caller, are you there? Had Marsha on for the last hour. We have opened up phone lines, and uh, we've got somebody that has called in. Bill, are you good with taking a call? Um, sure. <laughs> you really have to say uh, anything. Hey, call, but, caller, uh, are you there? I'd be on the, on the heels of what Mark just said. <laughs> Yeah, I think they're having technical uh, problems with them. So, okay. Yeah, well, go ahead and uh, we'll just keep moving on here through the article. Where do you want to start at as we kind of look at this? Well, I think a good place to start is to address a few of the issues people within the church are bringing against the book. Because I think we can understand the individuals who actually engage the book and take it as wholesale truth. But I think initially I'm more concerned with individuals who are in evangelicalism, who think that this is a good, sustainable work on theology. So I think it would be best to address a couple of their ideas with that, if you're fine with that. Sure. So I think one of the big things that we notice in this book is you'll have individuals, they'll make this type of a claim. Well, the shack is a work of fiction. And because it's a work of fiction, we have to give him the literary license to make, you know, a freedom of choice and the lack of precision that can come about from that type of genre of literature. So when, you know, individuals like myself or Dr. Geisler or a whole host of other people who have critiqued the book, you know, offer strong criticisms, well, we're just making a genre confusion. You know, we're trying to critique his book like it's a long systematic theology when the reality is he's writing fiction. Well, that sounds good on the surface. I mean, we, we don't deny that different types of literature try to present truth claims in different ways. But where we do disagree with them is that just because it's a work of fiction, that it's not making a truth claim. Because when we're reading through this book, we can see page by page he's making a sustained theological argument. He's not just trying to give an emotional feel. He's using the emotions to prove a theological point. A second issue that we find with this is that when we read the text of Scripture, we see there are different literary genres. You have poetry, you have history, you have parable, you have apocalyptic, you have what can be seen as prophecy and so forth. And even in all of those different genres of literature, we see sustained theological argument being made. Truth claims are being made. But the difference is, is that when Scripture is telling us something about God, regardless of the genre, it's telling us a true claim about God. Whereas when we look at the shack and we look at its sustained argument, regardless of its genre, we disagree with the fact that it's making false claims about God. Namely, he's offering this theological argument. He's attempting to communicate what he thinks is true about the biblical God. And even though we mask it in this different genre, it doesn't cause us or it shouldn't relinquish us from remaining consistent with the text of Scripture. I think that's probably the first issue a lot of evangelicals have struggled with, is the whole genre issue of it. Have you seen that, Devin? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's kind of the way that they... I'm not trying to take a shot at people, but it just seems the way how they it seems to be the way they dodge meaningful critique is they just say, Well, it's fiction and therefore, you know, because it's fiction they can say whatever you know, people can say whatever they want about the nature and character yeah. of God. I just think that's problematic. Exactly. It's like, you know, if reality exists and there is such a thing as truth, we have tests for truth. We have Uh, ways that we can understand the reality of truth. And if we're going to all of a sudden say certain genres shouldn't be held to a category of truth claims and sustainable theological critique, well, then we just have a whole body of literature out there that really, one, if it doesn't meet the test of truth, it doesn't tell us anything true, so we shouldn't read it. But if it does meet its test of truth, then we really need to take it through the rigors of 
systematic theology and biblical theology to test its validity. And I think that's one avenue that a lot of people get hung up on, and then they use that as a way of saying, oh, we really don't have to think about what the book's saying. So I think that's one issue I've seen in pop culture with it. Um, can, can I, I can, can I ask you a question with that real quick, Bill? And I talked to Marsha yeah. a little bit about this. Um, have you re- read uh, Tim Keller's um, his review of the Shack? I have read his review of the Shack. Okay, so he made some really good points because one of the one of the um, some of the pushback you may get from those who enjoy the Shack are going to say, well, if you're if you're going to say uh, you know, can't write fiction or whatever, then what do you do with Chronicles of Narnia and what do you do with uh, these other works? And uh, as Keller, you know, pointed out that uh, even in Lewis's work, he's not doing violence or diminishing the attributes of God. So what do you say to those who say, well, you know, so do we just not have any fiction, you know, about God or, or what? I don't think I would go so far as to say that we can't have good books that are fiction that can still communicate truth. I think that we should um, encourage that type of literature insofar as it's within the biblical bounds. I mean, I'll be honest. My favorite work of sort of allegory or fiction is the book Pilgrim's Progress. And I think a lot of people try to compare the shack to Pilgrim's Progress. But one of the sustainable differences between them is that Pilgrim's Progress is saturated with the biblical text and with the Bible's theology about God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, evil, suffering, and the cross, whereas the shack falls much short of that. And I think even what Keller's trying to get at is books like, you know, the Chronicles of Narnia and various other works, I would agree with him and say they're not doing violence to the nature of God or to just the entire theme and uh, narrative of scripture, whereas I think the shack is readily different in that sense. Um, so I would agree with both Keller and Marsha that, hey, we can't have sustainable fiction, but if that fiction doesn't meet up to what the Bible standards for truth claims are for individuals within the church, then we should probably warn people against reading those types of literature um, and say there are better works of fiction such as Pilgrim's Progress. Right. Okay. And uh, go ahead. You were, you were going to make a second point there. Actually, I think your work was a good segue into the second aspect of it. You know, a lot of people, they claim that they found, you know, meaningful significance out of the book. It helped them. Um, if you read some of the reviews floating around in the, or on the Internet right now about the movie, people are coming out, oh, I was in tears and the book helped me. And And I recognize that. I'm not going to just deny that people are having some type of an experience with it. But I think the big issue is is that just because the the shack helps you in whatever way you're defining help doesn't mean that it's biblical. We need to go to the evidence on it. And I think another thing that Keller made on that that was really a, a very good point is that when we look at this concept of what's going on, throughout the book, and we see this idea of suffering and how God calls us to deal with the the question of suffering, I just don't think that the shack or anybody influenced by the shack is actually going to be prepared to deal with evil and suffering. And the reason for it is, is that in order to overcome evil and suffering, you have to understand what the Bible teaches about the nature of God and his love for us and his providence in the midst of the situation and the fact that God is ordaining these things for our good and we have to understand God's answer to the problem of evil is ultimately found in the cross of Jesus Christ and his atonement for sin and in the hope of heaven. Whereas when we look at this book, it's portraying a different view of God, a different view of how suffering should relate, a different view of the cross, a different view of who actually gets into heaven. So I think when the Bible is saying, follow this narrative, and this is my answer to the problem of evil, the shack is presenting a competing narrative. And if the Bibles are sufficient guides, and a book is just undermining that sufficient guide, we know that it's not going to be sufficient for times of trouble or times sometimes when it means the most to us. So that's one of the big cautions that I have with the book is just those two practical aspects that people – 
seem to fall short on. And I can give you an example of it before we transition to it. When this book first came out um, several years ago, I was actually in Boone, North Carolina, and a very unfortunate incident happened there. And there was a student at the college who happened to commit suicide. And the, um, he was rushed to the ER as they were trying to figure out what's going on with him. And the parents came in, and an African-American lady came out, and she started talking to these people and told them this is what had happened, and she tried to condole or you know, give her condolences and comfort them at that time, and then they left. And at the funeral, you know what the lady said? I knew everything was going to be okay because God the Father appeared to me through the African-American doctor at the hospital, just like uh, in the shack. Oh, boy. You see, this is where, where theology matters and where it, the rubber meets the road. If you critique this book with this family, then you've got all the baggage to deal with. And you have to deal with unpacking all this theology. And I know there are hundreds of stories that can be similar to this all over the world because of this book. Right. That's good. Um, that's that's a really good point. Theology matters. One of the I uh, wanted to play a link from the shack because we're we're talking about theology matters here. One of the big problems that I have heard from several. Christian apologists uh, in their articles, and and folks, we're going to be compiling a list of articles and resources for you, uh, just to to be able to talk with with people on this on this topic because it's kind of an emotional issue. But um, I want to play this this um, soundbite here with William Young, and he's being <clears throat> interviewed on TBN, and uh, he says. He says a bunch of things. Uh, I played it with Marcia, got her reaction. I uh, would love to hear your, your thoughts on this. So I will go ahead and play this. This is uh, author of The Shack, Paul Young, being interviewed on uh, TBN. I believe it was the Praise the Lord broadcast. Matt, companion. And a good question, this is a line from Eve, a good question is worth a thousand answers. Wow. And so the questions that have come up, uh, and, and you'll hear some of them. Like I get, uh, I I get called uh, different things. Uh, my mom, even when she first time tried to read the shack, called me a heretic. But <laughs> but she's past that now. And that's a marvelous story. I'll Your tell mama you. Mama calls you a heretic. Yeah. That's bad. Yeah, she called my sister and did it. She didn't yeah. call me and did it. Oh, got it. So, <laughs> Your brother. Yeah, yeah. And it was when Papa came through the door. Oh, okay. So there's questions about is God more he than she, do we, you know, and that's one of the lies, that God is more he than she, or God is in control, yeah. or, I mean, things that we just make assumptions about that affect the way that we look at God. I get, I get called a universalist all the time, and in some senses, I, I'm, that's probably true. I believe the entire cosmos, the whole universe was created in Christ. If that's a universalist, I guess I am. Yeah. I believe that we were, that we were all included when Jesus, to, to quote scripture, when Christ died, we all died. Mm. And when he rose, we all rose. Mm. Right? That nothing that has come into being has come into being apart from him. But there are parts of the accusation of universalism that I am absolutely not. And and we get to talk about that inside a book like this. Got it. Right? So, I'm, I, I don't think all roads lead to God. If it wasn't, if it, because I believe Jesus is the creator. And everything is connected to him. And by being the creator, there is nothing in the entire cosmos that is not in relationship to Jesus. So there's no controversy, in other words, with the scripture that says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So that, you adopt that, right? And, the, and so you clear that type of stuff up. In correct. Your... And the, the only reason that there is any controversy about that verse at all is because we have a too low of a Christology. Our view of Jesus is too small. We just think that he is a response to Adam rather than the Creator who is the Father, Son, and anointed in the Holy Spirit. That means everything in the universe has a, has a connection to Jesus. Yeah, you know, as I was talking to Marsh, it sounds like we're going to have to do another show on his new book. There's some real problematic things in in, in that. It's, it's ambiguous, and give us your thoughts on this. 
Well, I want to start off by saying I agree with him. I don't want to have um, a view of Jesus that is too small. You know, I want to have a view of Jesus where he is creator, where he is Lord, where he is the Lamb of God slain for the sins of the world. But I also want to have one where he's recognized as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, who came first as a um, the Lamb of God, but yet he returns a second time, as we said, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, fully clawed, ready to display the fullness of the nature of God. And I think my biggest complaint with him is, is that the Bible does already present this full view of God and this full view of Christ, and it's not one that's inclusivistic. And there's a lot of language that's used in here. If you don't hold to his view of God, you have the smaller view of God and the weaker view of Christ, whereas I just think that we should question that outright, because how can I have a bigger view of Christ than the eternal Son of God who is in added humanity in the incarnation, bore the sins of humanity, and rose from the dead. And when we start to unpack a few of these things around inclusivism and universalism and so forth, I think people get confused in this language here. And as you're familiar, Nevin, you know universalism is the idea that um, all people in the entire world, regardless of whether Jesus Christ came or not, are going to go to heaven. So the good Buddhist, the good uh, Mormon, the good Muslim, the good Christian, they're all going to go to heaven. Whereas inclusivism is the belief that because of what Jesus did, people can go to heaven regardless, and here's whether or not they are a Christian, know about Christ, repented of their sins, and embraced them by faith. So one is trying to affirm the view that Jesus didn't have to die, come, or do anything, whereas inclusivism is, in a sense, half right, affirming Jesus had to die on the cross for the sins of humanity, but it's wrong in that it's giving this idea that somebody can have a lack of knowledge of Christ and a lack of faith in Christ and still get saved. And the issue is is that there's really no biblical support for it. It's a twist in right. these passages. I mean, you heard him in there, Acts uh, I mean, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. But yet we also see other passages where we see that there is no name given under heaven by which men can be saved. And the Bible says, unless you believe that I am the Son of God, you will die in your sins. The Bible also says, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. It also says... Whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the God's only Son. So I think the Bible pushes back against that idea. It, it gives us this, I, this concept and this truth claim that true faith in Christ requires knowledge of the biblical Christ, faith in the biblical Christ, repentance based off of the work of the biblical Christ, not a lack of knowledge, a lack of faith and a lack of belief in the biblical Christ. There are really two opposing religions at this point, not one that's sustainable together. Uh, and in that sense, it's really um, a false view of the entire economy of salvation. Phone number, folks, for those who are wanting to maybe call in and uh, talk with Bill is 760-542-3907, 760-542-3907. Uh, 3907. Bill, in your article, you, you kind of start there with problem one, uh, rejection of traditional Christianity. I, I looked at Rob Bowman's article uh, today, and Rob Bowman is an excellent theologian and uh, apologist. And one of the things he talks about is kind of an intro to um, William Young's life. And, man, it sounds like that guy really went through it. Um, from from what I was reading, he'd been uh, sexually abused for several years by priests and in the church, and uh, you can just tell the guy has just, uh, boy, he's been through it, and we don't want to make light of that, and, uh, you know, we want to be careful not to, you know, um, 
disrespect him in any way, but it seems as though a lot of his views uh, on the Christian faith, it just seems to be this rejection of kind of orthodox Christianity. Maybe talk talk about some of these points that uh, within the orthodox view, uh, Marcia had mentioned this idea of panentheism, and Rob, uh, Rob Bowman also mentioned that as well. So maybe you could speak a little bit more to that, and is also like the the idea of universalism uh, in that as well. Okay, I mean I agree with you, Devin. That I, you know, from what I've read, you know, Paul Young seems to have come from a very difficult background, and we want to offer grace and show charity in that sense. Uh, but just because we come from a difficult background doesn't give license for some of the claims that are being made here. And in fact, I would like to just say openly that I would love to, on any venue, sit down and discuss these matters with Paul Young, whatever format it can be on, just because I would really like to engage him on his ideas. Because it's a, the issue is, it's a worldview issue. You know, Christianity is a, a comprehensive worldview that attempts to answer questions related to the nature of God and Christ and humanity and the problem of evil, and the issue of sin. And when we look at the concepts of traditional Christianity, we find that Paul encourages us to hold fast to the scriptures and to follow the traditions that were handed down to us. Now, we know in that context in Thessalonians, um, as a good Protestant, I recognize that um, that's an issue of the what's known as an appositional use, where the traditions and the Word of God are being explained more in the Word of God, contained fully in the Word of God. And we also see how the Bible gives us an understanding of of the complete Christian narrative. But we also find that as church history unfolds, we see things in the Nicene Creed, Apostles' Creed, and in the Chalcedonian Creed, where they were very clear and precise about who Jesus was, what his mission was, what he accomplished on the cross, and it does the same for God the Father and the role of the church and the Holy Spirit and so forth. So I think what's going on here is is that in light of his experience, he's in many ways trying to throw out the baby with the bathwater. But the issue is is that Christ established his church. Christ established the parameters for that church. Christ establishes the doctrines for that church. And in many ways, if we're going to give up the parameters and the doctrines of the historic Christian faith, we're not just giving up the church. And we're not just giving up the church's doctrines. We're giving up Christ who founded that church. For we are founded on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets who were readily commissioned from Christ. So that's the big issue. He thinks that he's just pushing away from you know, a couple knuckle-dragging fundamentalists. When the reality is, is that as he pushes back against biblical Christianity, he's pushing back against Christ. So it's not a small deal in that sense. Remind me again, what was the second point that you wanted to look at? Was it the universalism issue again, or did you want to look at another aspect real quick? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, the universalism and the panentheism. Okay. I think in many respects we've, we've seen that he's – a lot of people charge him with, with universalism. And I think he claims to be an inclusivist. I think he recognizes that um, Jesus died for humanity, but the problem is is that um, he doesn't recognize that one must have faith in Christ and repentance towards Christ. And that's the difference between an exclusivistic view of the atonement versus an inclusivistic view of the atonement. Exclusivism, which is taught in the scriptures, teaches that, yes, Jesus Christ died for the sins of humanity, but we also are given the gift of faith and repentance to believe in Christ, and we have to have that knowledge and faith and repentance. Whereas Young is trying to say, Jesus died for this consummate view of a group of people of humanity. However, they don't have to have faith, knowledge, and belief in that Christ. And like we read earlier, that's just contrary to the biblical narrative. Uh, The second thing that you were trying to get at there is that, you know, we can get tied up in terms like panentheism, and we can also use terms such as process theology, which is this idea that God is changing, that God is um, trying to fulfill a pole or an end, um, that God requires us, that part of God's speaking nature necessitates 
that we be there because he has to have a conversation partner. Um, this is just classic process theology. Uh, we find it in a lot of dramatic approaches to doctrine that come about. Um, and the issue is, is that ultimately God does not have a nature in their view. God is merely a bundle of propositions. He's, he has the proposition of compassion today. He has the proposition of grace tomorrow, because you see these in you know, the text of the narrative. But what's to say that that proposition of grace or compassion today is going to mean that he has grace and compassion tomorrow? It doesn't. Right. The propositions right. don't give a sustainable continuity into the future. A nature does that. So that's why we say that God is compassionate by nature. God is uh, containing grace and gracious by nature. God is perfect by nature. And if God is necessarily perfect, he's unable to change. Therefore, we don't just have hope in the property of God's grace. We have hope in the nature of God's unchanging grace for the future. Whereas I don't think the shack can really give us that. That's my biggest issue. When you take his nature of God and you relate it to the problem of evil, you really have no hope that God's going to give you an answer to the problem of evil tomorrow, because God might not be the same tomorrow. And that's right. the fundamental difference. Seven six zero five four two three nine zero seven seven six zero five four two three nine zero seven. Friends, if you've got a call or a question, rather, feel free to call, and uh, we'd love to put you on and have a conversation with you. All right, uh, one of the other problems you have outlined here in this article is the rejection of sola scriptura. Talk to us. What is sola scriptura, and uh, how, has the, how has the shack kind of uh, diminished that? Sola scriptura is the belief that scripture and scripture alone is the sole infallible rule of faith for the church. Let me unpackage that. Scripture alone is the sole, meaning the only, infallible, it's not able to err, rule of authority for faith in the church. And I could package that and say that differently. Notice what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that it's just um, me and my Bible and no theology. I'm not saying that historical witnesses such as John Calvin and Luther don't have any influence in this. I'm not saying it's no tradition. I'm just putting tradition in its rightful place. Namely, it's a servant to the scriptures, not the master over it. Tradition has a ministerial authority, not a magisterial authority. Scripture has the ability to, in a sense, um, bind the conscience, whereas tradition does not. And what's going on here is, is that particularly with the shack, he's rejecting Scripture or the authority of the Bible to determine matters of faith and practice. Rather than finding the Bible by the altar in a little country church and getting comfort and counsel from the Word of God, he's saying we need to go to an empty shack in the wilderness with no Bible, and somehow we're able to cope with all of life's tragedies and the problem of evil. And he actually says this at one point in his book. He says the the author rejects what, in seminary, he had been taught that God had completely stopped any overt communication with moderns, preferring to have them only listen and follow sacred scripture. He says God's voice had been reduced to paper. It seems that direct communication with God was something exclusive for the ancients and that nobody wanted a God in a box, just in a book. And while that sounds really good, you know, to people who are, given over to his worldview, the problem is is that as we look at this, he's trying to say what he'd been taught in seminary with this overt communication from God has stopped. But the issue is, is that the Bible does teach that it is the sole and fallible rule of faith and that it is we have a closed canon. God isn't giving new revelations here and there. Um, aberrant groups throughout the history of the church have usually undermined the concept of sola scriptura in one of two ways. They either use things like tradition um, that doesn't agree with the Word of God, or they're claiming things like um, revelation teaches me contrary. Both are 
undermining the concept of sola scriptura because what ends up being the sole authority in tradition and scripture is tradition over scripture. And what happens here is experience trumps revelation, biblical revelation, or these new encounters trump what the biblical text is saying. So in that sense, he's rejecting scripture as the sole authority. He's really giving us this idea of experience or um, divine direct encounters from God as the final authority. So that's this, the first is, half of it. Yeah, just just real quick, Bill. I was just going to say, this, and this this is not, unfortunately, something that is unique to the shack, is it? I mean, you've got man, this happens all. It seems like it happens all the time with churches today, where they really, especially you know, I don't. Don't want to get too narrow, but sometimes in the Pentecostal and charismatic movement, especially, it's this idea of, of experiencing God, you know, and that's because um, God's not just contained to a book, and God's not just you know a bunch of propositions, and so it really seems to almost undermine the idea of sola scriptura, like you're saying. It does. Um, we recognize that you know, as we look at William Young, which channel was he on when he did that interview that you played earlier? TBN. How do they justify most of their theological claims? Divine, direct revelation. How did Benny Hinn revise his view of the Trinity and come up with nine heads to the Godhead? Divine, direct revelation. So this is nothing new to William Young. In fact, it, it really is the offshoot of many individuals within sort of the Pentecostal charismatic movement it's also the means that a lot of our cults develop their view of doctrine. It's a lot of the ways that um, even other world religions try to say that God speaks with them. But we realize that God has spoken in a book, and if you want to hear God speak out loud, read your Bible out loud. Um, <laughs> and the yeah. second aspect is, is that they try to say, oh, you put God in a box. And you know, nobody wants to be in a box. You know, we frown upon keeping puppies in a box when they're, they want to run out in the yard right after they've been born. And we don't like to put people in cages. So, oh, how could you ever put God in a box? That's such a terrible thing. Well, the issue is everybody puts God in some kind of box. Namely, you say God can only do this or God must be contained and act according to his nature. Or you put him in the box or the conditions that say, God can constantly be doing other things all the time. The point is you're saying God acts this way. Whatever that act is, is the limitations or the restrictions or the definitions that you place upon God. So it's really self-referentially incoherent at that point. Yep, I fully agree with you on that. That is that is an excellent point with the Sola Scriptura. One of the few that I've seen actually point that out. Um, let's see, as I'm looking through the article here, did you want to add anything else to the doctrine of the Trinity, or did you want to go to uh, the unbiblical view of punishing sin? Where do you want to go with that? Um, let's actually look at his concept here. I actually want to look at the false view of the Incarnation at one okay, point. Great. And one thing that he's trying to say is that the Father, or God the Father, <laughs> becomes human in Jesus. So just by way of contrast, we understand that the classic doctrine of the Trinity teaches that God has one nature with three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. And We're used to these classic definitions, nothing new, the classic view of the Trinity that's always been out there. But never once do you find God the Father became the Son in the Incarnation. Um, historically, that was recognized as a heresy in the history of the Church, known as right. modalism. It's really teaching that you have one person of the Trinity, not three persons of the Trinity, and that God the Father becomes Jesus at the moment of the Incarnation, and then becomes the Holy Spirit after his ascension, and we're now living the age of the Holy Spirit in which God gives us direct revelations, and we're down that whole journey again. But that's not the biblical view. Just think about it. 
in Jesus' baptism, what do we find? You find Jesus going under the water, God the Father saying, this is my beloved son in whom I love. Listen to him, some of them will say. Um, Also, we see what's happening. The Holy Spirit descends on him as though a dove. So you you see all three persons of the Trinity in one instance, all defined, all distinct, yet all united in their godhood. Another instance where we find it is when we're looking at the Great Commission. We see that it's go therefore into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. How in the world can I baptize somebody in the name of the God, God the Father and the Son if the Father is the Son? I can't. Good point, yeah. <laughs> There's no way that I can do it. it. It breaks down the Trinitarian formula. It breaks down the historic baptismal Trinitarian formula. So we find in those two aspects there, in the baptism passages, we can almost call them, where we see a, a breakdown of this idea of the concept of the incarnation. Um, as we keep going here, we also see things like this, where he says, when we three spoke ourselves into human existence as the Son of God, we became fully human. So now listen to this. All three, sometimes he would say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, spoke themselves into humanity. But here's another interesting thing about Shaq. You have to read with a discerning eye, because sometimes he has this concept of wisdom, which is almost like the fourth head to the Godhead. And I think that's one of the aspects he has in reference here. We, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and wisdom who's floating around out there, all spoke ourselves into human existence as the Son of God. And it says we chose to embrace all the limitations that this entailed. Even though we have always been present in the universe, we now became flesh and blood. However, this is a serious misunderstanding of the person of the Godhead who assumed the human nature in addition to his divine nature. Neither the Father nor the Holy Spirit, who is pure spirit, became human or added flesh. Only the Son did. That's so clear for the Chalcedonian Creed as we look at it. Um, You know, kind of belaboring this just for the sake of time, we have Athanasius. Do we remember who that is? The great... Oh, yeah. St. Athanasius. The great teacher, Athanasius. And what was his major concept that he used, the, the Latin phrase, Athanasius contra mundo, Athanasius against the world. And what he was battling at this point was a bunch of Arians who were denying the deity of Christ um, following during his time period. And what he tried to do is sustain a biblical view of Christ. And what we see following from here is this idea that he gave us this phrase, In the Incarnation, it wasn't the subtraction of deity, but the addition of humanity. It's not the subtraction of deity, but the addition of humanity. We could change that and say that in the Incarnation, it wasn't the dilution of the plurality in the Godhead. Rather, it was Jesus the second person of the Godhead, adding humanity. And I think that's where Young goes wrong in that sense. It's just not a classic view of the Trinity. It is totally aberrant, and it's really a novelty in its own sense. He he just seems to really kind of blow it when it comes to, well, a lot of things, uh, theologically. Part of the issue is, is with the interviews that I've heard, and, and again, I'm not trying to be too critical, uh, of him, but um, folks, uh, real quick here, we got a few minutes. If you guys, if anybody wants to call in, seven six zero five four two three nine zero seven. We had some calls, and they, for whatever reason, dropped off. But I uh, got a few minutes left here. Seven six zero five four two three nine zero seven. Give us a call. We'll put you right on with uh, with Bill. But uh, again, not to be too critical, but uh, the interviews I've seen, he really kind of um, undermines the necessity for theology and almost the, you know, there's a, there's a discussion with him and Matt Slick uh, that happened, you know, seven or eight years ago when the book came out 
And he just really, you know, kind of, well, that's just, you know, your theological mumbo jumbo and you can't confine God to a box. And I just, it's problematic when you have people that do that. You just, you see the the Rob Bells and you see these other guys. Um, I just, I don't know. I just wonder if he's on that kind of a trajectory because it seems like scripture and it seems like theology and doctrine and these things he didn't he he doesn't want to be confined to that what what are your thoughts am i, am I off the mark on that i think you're sustainably correct at that point and i you know one thing that young gets right is he's trying to um interact with the questions of the day that's a good thing you know we want to answer the questions that our neighbors are asking and who in this world is uh, free from asking the question, how do I deal with evil and suffering? But like we said before, he is trying to give a sustainable theology, whether he wants to admit it or not. Um, you know, when we sit there and we say, well, I just love Jesus. I had an encounter with Jesus. Well, who is Jesus? The liberal Jesus? The Bartian, neo-evangelical, neo-orthodox Jesus? Are we going to have Rudolf Boltmann's demystified Jesus? Are we going to have the Aryan Jesus who lacks divinity? Or are we going to have the biblical view, the evangelical view of Jesus, who is the Jesus who came, lived a perfect life, died upon the cross, rose from the, from the dead, paid the penalty for our sins. He provides the righteousness by his ability to keep the law, the act of obedience of Christ, or the liberal Jesus that doesn't do that, or the neo-Orthodox Jesus that's the encountering Jesus. And the problem is, is that when you say you just love Jesus, there's not just one Jesus floating around in this world. (laughs) There's multiple Jesuses. Yes. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. You have to be clear on who you're talking about. And let's just give a biblical example of this. Jesus died on the cross, right, Devin? We recognize that. We do. And, and on the day that Jesus died, what were some of the claims that the people were, were making about him at this point? We see the, uh, the Romans were glad that they finally put away this criminal that was just causing a bunch of ruckus in the, in the land. You see the Jews that were glad that they killed the blasphemer, You see the apostles that were brokenhearted because of the fact that this man that they followed had died, and they were like sheep scattered at this point. We see other individuals weeping, but we also see the individual who's standing at the foot of the cross, one of the guards, who says, truly, this is the Son of God. The point is, there's lots of different interpretations of Jesus. And the reason that the Bible is so important is that it not only just gives us a view of Jesus, it gives us the divine view of Jesus, and it gives us the divine interpretation of the person and work of Jesus. And the reason that books like The Shack are so dangerous is that when you have one coming with divine authority, namely Scripture, and you see another narrative, like the one coming from The Shack, that completely goes contrary to the narrative presented in Scripture, we find that it's not only just a false view of Jesus, but it presents a completely different narrative of Jesus. And that's what's so sustainably urgent about evangelicals speaking up about this issue. Yeah. Yeah, amen. we got a few minutes left, Bill. I, I, want, you to, I want you to tackle this. There's so much. It's funny, we're doing this show for two hours, and it's like there's still so much to hit. But uh, in your article, you have problem five. Uh, an unbiblical view of punishing sin. Can you can you talk to that for a few minutes? Sure. We can definitely take a look at that. So, you know, one of the things that we see, and you can find this in the article here, um, Young states that, you know, there's no need for God to punish sin. In fact, he says, and that, Papa stopped her preparations and moved towards Mac. You could see a deep sadness in her eyes. I am not who you think I am, Mackenzie. I don't need to punish people for sin. Sin is its own punishment, devouring you from the inside. It is not my purpose to punish it. It's my joy 
to cure it. Now, we agree, sin is a punishment. Romans chapter 1, God hands us over to our sins, and the handing over is a punishment in and of itself. But we also find, as we continue to come back to Scripture, that the message is dangerously imbalanced, dangerously leaning towards one side, and it leaves so many texts of Scripture just unaccounted for. And we find this, that God is not only love and compassion, but he's also holy and just. And it's because a just God must punish sin. We realize that in the Old Testament it says, for I am holy, says the Lord. And we know that it says that the eyes of the Lord are purer than to see evil, and he can't look at wrongdoing. We also realize that Paul in Romans says, for the wages of sin is death. And Paul later says, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So we realize that the Bible does talk about the fact that all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. And the Bible also says that for the wages of sin are death. And the fact is, you know, he's looking at all these instances of evil and suffering and death. That's sin. And a just God just cannot look over sin. Right. A good judge can't just look over sin. He must punish right. it. If a judge goes out there and sees somebody get raped and looks at the rapist and says, you know, it's not my job here to throw you into jail. It's to cure you and help you get over this. And sends him out of there with a pat on the back and sheds a tear with him. It's not a good judge. It's a terrible judge. Yeah. A judge should be thrown in jail for allowing this Um, atrocious act to continue out in society. But the point is is that when we look at this, what we see in 1 Corinthians 15 is that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And Paul goes on to say, by which you are being saved. Saved from what? Saved from that just and holy God who can't look on sin and who punishes sin with his wrath. And, you know, he's trying to say, well, I'm trying to deal with the big questions of life. And I'm trying to deal with how people can resolve the biggest tensions. Well, as somebody who studied church history, I realized there was another man who wanted to deal with the biggest questions of life and struggled with the problem of evil on a daily basis, and that was Martin Luther. But Martin Luther came to a completely different conclusion. He realized that if... If God is truly just and God is truly righteous, he cannot look over sin. But that's why we have Christ. Christ is the one who bore our punishment for our sins. And by faith and repentance in him, we can address humanity's biggest problem, the sin problem. Right. Because what's the bigger problem? To face God clothed in the rags of your sin? or by faith and repentance, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We know what the Bible teaches. And I think that what we find in Young is this unbiblical view of punishing sin is just contrary to the God of the Bible. Yeah. Yes, I think, folks, unfortunately, at the end of the day, there's a lot of things in that book that uh, just doesn't match the God of the Bible. And uh, for that reason... I can't endorse that book, and I would never recommend it to a friend to read uh, because there's one of these one of these things where there's a lot of bones and not a whole lot of meat. And uh, you know, we hope this show has been, been helpful to you guys. Um, Bill, any any parting words here as we we end this episode? To church leaders out there, I would say make yourself familiar with this book, be able to engage with this book, because people have questions about it. To those of you who are sympathetic to the shack, I just really ask that you um, compare what that book teaches to what the scriptures teach and to the testimony of God's faithful saints throughout the ages. Remember, we are the recipients of the grand narrative of scripture and the bountiful work of great theology throughout the ages. And just because Young wants to turn away from that, I encourage you, don't think that you have to also. Don't try to be a maverick unto his cause. 
be a uh, a rebel under the cause of what the scriptures say, and you'll find that you're at that point on the right side of not only history but the text of scripture. Amen. Bill, thank you for coming on, buddy. It's always a pleasure to have you on, and I know we'll have you uh, back on in the future. Thanks again to Marcia uh, Montenegro for also coming on, and uh, really appreciate you guys taking the time to uh, come and speak with us. Folks, uh, you know, two hours we've spent, a little over two hours, uh, really diving into some of these problematic issues. Uh, If you go to our Facebook page, you will see both articles from uh, Marcia on there and the article uh, from Dr. Geisler and uh, Bill. And uh, you can go there. You can read those articles. You can see some of the main points there uh, that is made. And, uh, you know, feel free to, to share the articles. Please share the show. Share the podcast on your page. And that way people can see kind of in a detailed analysis you know, what are some of the errors of the shack? I think we've tried to be fair, try to be even-handed. Um, you know, there are some, some decent things in the book, uh, but there is just a lot of problems with it. So anyway, uh, appreciate you guys coming and joining us, and uh, we will be back hopefully next week, God willing, with some more shows. So uh, until next time, God bless. Babies come from. Uh, well, uh. Honey? Mommy went to the store. Oh, well, you see, um, well, there's a mommy and a daddy, right? Right. And see, when they call Geico, uh, they could save a bunch of money on car insurance. Oh, really? And that makes them happy? Yes, that makes them very happy. That's good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we could have this talk, sunshine. <laughs> Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. Steinmart's 12-hour sale is a real...